All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, we would like to welcome you to today's webinar on the ethical handling of incidental findings in research. This webinar is organized by Viviana Eric, LC Services and Research. And the management of incidental findings is currently one of the core topics of the task force societal issues. For this reason, we are very happy uh, to have with us today Dr. Eileen Bonnick from BBMRI Netherlands um, to kick off this discussion on incidental findings. My name is Melanie Goisov. I'm research officer at BBMRI Eric uh, LC and lead of the task force societal issues. Uh, before I in, will introduce today's speaker, I want to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded. This includes the question and answer session oops, at, um, at the uh, end of this webinar. Uh, we will make the recording available on our website. Uh, we've preserved some time at the end for questions, and you can add, add your questions to the GoToWebinar panel, which you can see here. Uh, feel free to add your questions during the webinar, and we will go through it at the end. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Elin uh, Bonnick. Um, she is Assistant Professor at the Department of Medical Ethics, Philosophy and History of Medicine at Erasmus MC. Uh, and she has a background in philosophy. In 2014, she completed a PhD project on ethical issues in genomic testing. Uh, she's led uh, research projects in medical ethics and uh, research ethics with a special focus on the ethical implications of technological innovation in clinical practice. And she's currently interested in access and funding models for new medical cancer treatments. She serves on committees and advises on national and international research projects and teaches medical ethics and research ethics at undergraduate, graduate and postgraduate levels at Erasmus MC and elsewhere. Her uh, fields of expertise include um, ethical issues in uh, compassionate use and access to innovative me medical treatments, uh, ethics of uh, predictive medicine, genetics and genomics, epigenetics, biomarkers, research ethics, incidental findings, informed consent, reproductive ethics, prenatal screening, organ donation and uh, transplantation. And I will now hand over to um, Eileen for um, her presentation. Yes, thank you. <laughs> And welcome. Uh, welcome to uh, this webinar. Thank you for BBMRI, Eric, to invite me for this, um, for this session on the ethical handling of incidental findings in research. Now, you are all uh, involved somehow in biobank research, so you must be familiar with um, uh, with, with incidental findings. And I hope that this webinar will help you to reflect and maybe upon and maybe refine some of your local policies and practices at your institutions. Can you all see my screen? I hope so. I hope this works well. Yes, I can see it. Okay. Um, good. So, my name is Elina Binnick. I was uh, kindly introduced to you. I'm a medical ethicist. I have run several uh, research projects in the area of ethics of incidental findings. And one of them was a couple of years ago in which we've developed a guidance document, a practical guide for researchers and those involved in biobank research for, for the handling of incidental findings. And this guidance document was recently translated to English and that was the occasion, I guess, for this uh, for this webinar. Most of my um, research projects that I've conducted on this topic were conducted in the area of imaging. So I will uh, use many examples from from the area of imaging in this talk. Well, this is what we'll do this afternoon. Um, 
first, I will give a little, you a little bit of background about incidental findings and about the ethical dilemma that is posed by incidental findings. And then I will tell you what is known about the impact of incidental findings on research participants or biobank donors. Firstly, because I think that's, that it's interesting and also important to know what incidental findings do to biobank donors or research participants. And also because we have two publications coming up and I thought it would be nice to share with you already some of the main findings from that work. Um, in the second part of the webinar, I will talk to you about existing ethical guidance and present to you a seven-step framework that we've developed for uh, devising policies and practices uh, for the handling of incidental findings. And then hopefully we'll have some time for discussion too. So to start, uh, there are a lot of definitions of incidental findings around, but I particularly like this one that comes from a uh, a paper by Meike Vernoy in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it actually highlights three characteristics, I think, that are important if we want to understand what incidental findings are. So firstly, they are detected during the course of research. So we're specifically talking about research settings and not clinical settings. And secondly, they are beyond the scope of the research. And so that means that they exclude actually the findings that we are looking for in research. So the individual research results, as they are commonly referred to, or in the US, uh, there is this um, notion of secondary findings, findings that we're also routinely, systematically looking for in addition to the, the findings that we're um, looking for strictly for the purposes of research. So, um, and the clinical relevance. So that's the, the third characteristic. We are talking about findings that are clinically relevant and not uh, lacking such relevance. So there are different types of incidental findings. Bindings can be detected in imaging, in laboratory testing, in genetics, but also for instance, if a researcher incidentally finds a skin lesion, lesion uh, on a research participant, uh, that is also an incidental finding. And incidental findings of whatever nature will pose a dilemma for researchers. Namely, what will we do? Do we, do we tell the research participant or the biobank donor about the finding? And this is a dilemma, a real ethical dilemma, because telling the research participant or the biobank donor about the finding can bring benefits. Early detection allows often for timely intervention with possibly better health outcomes. But on the other hand, there are risks and burdens and costs associated with the feedback of incidental findings too. So for instance, the biobank donor will be referred to a clinician and follow-up testing will have to be done and maybe treatment. And this exposes the research participant to physical risks. But there are also burdens, maybe anxiety and distress about the finding and the costs associated with the, the follow-up trajectory. And some of that will be um, unnecessary um, because some of the findings actually don't uh, appear to be, turn out to be of, of clinical relevance or importance. And so this ethical dilemma, this weighing of benefits and, and risks and costs and burdens is actually more pressing when we think of uh, the research setting in which we're actually talking about healthy volunteers. Healthy volunteers that come in and undergo a test and come back as maybe patients or maybe pre-patients. So it seems that we might be people, might be making people worse off. And even if we're talking about a clinical biobank, um, the incidental finding will pertain to a condition uh, that is not the condition for which the, the research participant was enrolled in the clinical biobank. So in that sense, in relation to that new incidentally detected condition, the patient was actually healthy in the sense that the, the research participant or the biobank volunteer hasn't sought help for a problem, doesn't have any symptoms in relation to the incidental finding doesn't have complaints, so isn't actually sick. And so we're turning 
healthy or otherwise healthy volunteers into patients and this runs counter to one of the fundamental ethical principles in, in medicine, namely the principle of non-maleficence. First, do no harm. So, feeding back incidental findings actually makes people worse off, but can only be justified if the benefits outweigh the risks and the burdens and the costs. And this is not always the case. I have three examples. Um, we talked about, we talked with uh, a large set of researchers and biobank directors and directors of screening programs in the Netherlands to find out how uh, incidental findings were being handled in the various locations. And this is a researcher who is also working as a clinical neuroradiologist who is showing us a scan of the brain of a seven-year-old child. And this researcher explains how he's actually haunted by this case. So we talked about this case and referred the child to a neurologist, he says. We are thinking about a glioma, but it's in the brain stem. You cannot operate in that area of the brain. The only thing we can do is wait, and it can take 10 or 15 years before the child develops any symptoms. The kid is seven year old. I don't feel good about this. We have not made anyone happy, not the parents, not the child. This researcher was saying, this is actually comparable to handing somebody a death sentence and not being able to offer anything in return. This is a second example of the downsides of the reporting of incidental findings. A patient with a lung tumor, which was relatively small and easy to be treat, easily treatable. And initially you would think this is a good thing because now there is still time to act, but the man has operated upon a resection of the lung but complications occur and the man dies. And in a certain sense, the man dies because of the study. Um, this is exceptional and it's tragic. And sort of the defining characteristic of tragedy is that this is, that it's, it's nobody's fault. Nobody has done anything wrong. There was nobody to blame really, but the outcomes are terrible. And I have a final example of the downside of incidental findings. And this is, probably a well-known example of false positives, uh, something that turns out to be stable and simply benign, um, but it wasn't nice for the research participants to be to have to be monitored for a long time and to be sort of in, uh, to remain in uncertainty for a while about whether or not the incidental finding actually indicates a serious disease and, and has to be treated. So you don't want to put that on someone's plate, this researcher says. Uh, and we don't do that. We don't actively screen for incidental findings. We w want to interfere as little as possible in somebody's life when it isn't really necessary. Um, so there are reasons not to feed back incidental findings. And the first we've seen, non, the principle of non-maleficence, sometimes it is better not to act because acting may cause harm. And there are notions of privacy and autonomy. Um, the, the person has not sought help for, a, for any problem and may not want to receive this type of information. And there is another consideration, namely if you as a research group or as a biobank, if you um, have a very active policy of feeding back results and incidental findings, um, you may feed into what is sometimes referred to as this diagnostic misconception, this mistaken idea that research participants may have um, that they are diagnosed or that they are checked, that their health is being, is being checked. I will come back to that. But of course, there are upsides too. There is a consideration of beneficence. We can actually maybe improve and protect the health of people. Um, and also there may be a right to know. There are also autonomy considerations favoring feedback of incidental findings. And there is this principle of reciprocity or benefit sharing. Research participants or biobank donors may feel I'm doing this for you and you can maybe some, do something in return for me, namely, tell me about potentially interesting research findings. 
Now, what do donors want? There has been quite some research into what biobank donors want. This is a study in genetics, and you can see that an overwhelming um, majority of research participants want to, to receive secondary findings in this case, but it, this also applies to um, individual research results and incidental findings. Um, and even if these findings are non-actionable, and I have spoken to a lot of research participants, and research participants are even interested in information that is difficult to interpret, or information that is a very limited clinical validity that is not very well understood also by medical specialists, even uninterpretable information people are interested in. But I'm wondering then, what does all of this difficult to interpret information, what does it do to research participants or biobank donors? Actually, little is known about the impact on donors. Um, Doctors are concerned about the burdens for patients and uh, about the waste of time and, and resources and unnecessary follow-up. Um, but we don't know if biobank donors or research participants experience that burden so much. This is one of the very few uh, larger studies from Germany and it shows that a minority of research participants experience distress while waiting for the result of their scan and afterwards but that most participants are very satisfied with learning about findings and very much in favor of feedback of findings so strongly endorse feedback of findings and even on the long term it was seen that the feedback of incidental findings did not adversely or negatively affect quality of life or depressive symptoms indicators. So it seems that maybe the feedback of incidental findings is not so harmful as some of these examples that I have just shown you suggest. This is a focus group study from the Netherlands with incidental findings in whom, uh, with research participants in whom an incidental finding was detected. And uh, it details their experiences. Um, this is consistent with other literature. It seems that the disclosure of test results for many research participants is an important reason why they wish to participate, an important motivation for them to take part. Uh, research participants seem to have very high expectations in relation to incidental findings. And also it seems that time and timing is of the essence, really important to have a very short time between the acquisition of the data and the reporting of the finding, and also between the reporting of the finding and the clinical follow-up of the finding. And this was not just a need among research participants, this was also expressed in terms of a moral imperative, in terms of reciprocity. You owe me as a researcher, you owe me a timely and prompt handling of incidental findings. This is what the sort of the general feeling was. We've seen that in our interview study too. And participants were grateful for having learned about the incidental finding. The German study showed that too. And I think this is a very interesting point. There may be some kind of a positive feedback loop in research participants or biobank participants when it comes to incidental findings because either the finding turns out to be benign and then the research participant can be relieved and grateful or the finding turns out to be serious and then timely intervention is possible. So it seems that uh, by definition research participants are going to experience satisfaction with a feedback process but we will come back to that because I have serious questions in regards to that. Um, in terms of the expectations, we have done a qualitative study a couple of years ago in Rotterdam and um, I was trying to find out what research participants expect. And this is a man who talks about the way that he perceives benefits from, from research participation. He feels 
that taking part in research, this is a longitudinal cohort study with uh, study visits every couple of years with extensive medical testing and imaging and genetics. And this man feels that he's being taken care of better by participating in the study than, for instance, when he visits the GP. Because when he goes to the GP, the GP will ask, how are you doing? Are you experiencing any troubles? And that's it. But if he goes to the research center, the researchers will look into his body, will, will try to see uh, what his, his status is. And he feels that he knows more about his health and receives better care than in clinical practice. And this is another person. And I asked her, if you lie in the scanner, what do you think? What do you, what do you think happens? Uh, do you expect someone to be looking at this scan? Um, who is that person and how are they looking at your scan? And this woman says, yes, of course, you'd expect that they look through the brain, wouldn't you? They're doing an examination of the brain. It's brain research. They'll check the entire thing. And this is, I think, important to take note of these high expectations of research participants or biobank donors. Um, but when it comes to that positive feedback loop, it feels and it seems that incidental findings and the receiving of this information is a good thing. But there are also what I sometimes call hidden harms. This is a quote from an interview with a, a lady in whom a small meningioma was detected that is benign and may or may not become symptomatic and it is perfectly possible that she will live another, she was an elderly lady, another 10 or 20 years without the meningioma ever becoming problematic. So there was actually nothing wrong with her. And she talks about the long-term impact of that incidental finding on her life and on the wedding of her daughter. And she says that uh, this hurts her because her daughter was very worried and emotional and afraid that mom wouldn't be able to see what I looked like in my wedding dress. And so I think that these sort of ripple effects, but in the long term, not only on the research participant or the biobank donor, but also on their social surroundings are not yet very well documented, but I think that they are there. This is a final example um, of a study that we've recently done with younger research volunteers. These were students mainly. And this was a student who talks about on a Friday afternoon receiving a letter from the study center saying that the research participant should uh, contact their GP, their general practitioner, uh, and it said that something had been found in the brain, but it didn't offer the letter, it didn't offer any details about what it was uh, that was found in the brain. And so this, this kid really says, they didn't tell me anything, literally everything that you start to imagine you think is going to be true. So I was almost sort of arranging my funeral. And this was a very enervating, distressing time for them um, in between knowing that something had been found and finding out what it was. And this is another person who says that the whole experience did affect them. Um, the idea that, that you're being woken up from the illusion that you're invincible, these are young people, a sort of sense of security and that bubble has burst for me. Um, these are sort of the, the softer impacts that you're not going to capture when you're measuring um, depressive symptoms, but these I think are very real impacts of, of incidental findings. So let's take a little pause and have a little summary of what we've seen so far. Um, research participants or donors prefer to know about incidental findings and report positive experiences, but there are harms too, there are downsides, costs, burdens, and researchers and, and doctors are a lot less positive generally about incidental findings, and research participants and donors seem to have very high expectations, but this, this depends a little bit on the research setting and we will come back to that soon and there's this sense of reciprocity at least in the research participant community if you are interested in this theoretically in, in this topic i can recommend the work by richardson and belsky on ancillary care obligations uh, which is interesting so now we move to the second part of uh, the talk 
um, protocols and practices for handling incidental findings today are varied, variable across countries, uh, but also within countries and across institutions. Um, there are differences, very strong differences. And I think that I have a quote on the next two slides that I think illustrates that variety, but also I think is, is funny in itself. We did um, an interview study with a lot of um, researchers and directors of biobanks, directors of screening programs, I said this. And we talked to senior researchers, but we also wanted to talk with junior researchers to see uh, what the policies and the practices actually looked like on the ground. So not only on paper, but also on the work floor. So this is us talking to three PhD researchers working at two different centers within one city. The one, uh, uh, the one researcher says, you're not really going to look for things, right? But if you see something, you report that. That's what a protocol says. But isn't there a hospital-wide protocol that says, okay, this is how you check for incidental findings? No, you don't really have to check, right? It's an incidental finding when you come across something. No, that's right, there's no need to check, but if you see something, you report. That's the protocol. But it's not like everyone will look at scans in the same way or search for things. I think, says the third person, it's actually better not to look for things. This illustrates how these young PG researchers um, are discussing this issue and how they are being instructed differently at different sites. So just to be clear, you make a screenshot only if participants ask. We don't routinely offer it to them. You don't, we always just give it to them. What, a screenshot or a CD? A CD with everything so that they have all the images to scroll through? Yes. Does your center really advise against that? Definitely. I am told not to even to show the computer screen to participants. They really like it, especially since it's about their own brain. One participant even had his brain scan printed on a t-shirt, says one. So you can see that uh, they, these students are discussing very different policies in the same, in the same city in my country. Um, there is existing ethical guidance, uh, and I think this is an important report that I can also recommend to you. This is from the Presidential Commission. It was issued in late 2013, and a lot of the existing ethical guidance can be summarized as follows. Um, a protocol must be set up for the management of incidental findings. Donors or participants should be informed ideally about that protocol as part of the informed consent process. Incidental findings should be confirmed before they are reported to research participants. And decisions about feedback should be made ideally in multidisciplinary teams, but at least in consultation with an expert. Um, one important consideration when deciding about whether or not the finding needs to be fed back is this clinical relevance, treatability, actionability, utility. Um, there are a lot of different definitions and classifications around, uh, but the basic idea is that there should be benefits to be obtained, benefits to balance and to outweigh the sets of risks and burdens that we've talked about. And this is also the Presidential Commission report. Research ethics review committees should ideally review the protocol. Um, in the Netherlands too, we, in the absence of any real specific legislation, we have a code of conduct for responsible use of human tissue. And um, this says, this is a very restrictive policy. It tells research to be very hesitant about the feedback of incidental findings, sort of a no unless policy. And um, uh, uh, I think it's interesting that this policy is so restrictive 
uh, but I also have this observation with regards to this um, with regards to this this guidance, namely that I think it's interesting that the guidance only starts after an incidental finding has been detected. Um, so it doesn't say anything about what precedes an incidental finding. It happens once the observation has been made. And this, I think, is typical for a lot of existing guidance and for other codes, um, that this uh, everything that precedes the finding is not discussed. And we've written about this a couple of years ago, um, saying that if, if you look at the word incidental, the term actually means uh, occurring by chance, occurring merely by chance. But incidental findings do not occur merely by chance. Um, we know that they happen and we also know how often they happen. In brain imaging, for instance, the incidence of incidental findings in healthy research volunteers is about 2.7%. We know this. And Surprisingly, in genetics and whole exome sequencing, we have that same number. So incidental findings are no longer unexpected. They are not unexpected. We know that they occur, but also we know how they occur. We know how they come about. And there are various factors that will influence whether or not findings are detected. Um, and these are technical factors, what types of data, are we acquiring, but also uh, organizational aspects. What training and background do the researchers who are taking the measures, analyzing the data have, and what do we instruct them? How do we tell them to look at the data? Do we tell them to avoid findings or do we uh, tell them to flag abnormalities so that they can be looked at? And all these factors will affect whether or not incidental findings are detected. So, in this paper in the European Journal of Epidemiology, we argued that um, incidental findings are not stumbled upon, they are created. We are creating the conditions under which they happen, and we are responsible for those conditions. And another problem, I think, when I look at the existing guidance, is that uh, uh, it does require that a pathway should be in place, for the handling of incidental findings, but it doesn't always specify what that pathway should look like. And I think that is understandable because different research settings may require different pathways. Um, for instance, if you have a scanning facility that only actually does functional MRIs for behavioral studies at a psychology department, for instance, that is different in a morally relevant way from a biobank that is focused on health and disease and maybe located within a hospital and maybe has involvement of medical doctors um, on the ground. And those things, the goals of the research, the location, the presence or not of medical doctors, but also the invasiveness of the measurement and the commitment that is required from biobank participants or donors. If you have a biobank that only asks for one blood draw, that's different than a bank that a, a, has multiple points of contact over time and actually does invasive testing on a regular basis, for instance. These factors will determine to a great extent what research participants or biobank donors will expect from the research team. And I do believe that these expectations have to somehow align with, fit with what is actually happening, fit with the existing pathway or protocol there. And as a rule of thumb, I would say that the more the biobank is medical in nature, the more demanding the protocol or the pathway for the handling of incidental findings should be, because the expectations of the research participants are reasonably oriented towards a more active feedback policy, I would argue. So, for instance, the NIH in America requires that on its campuses, all research scans are examined by a qualified member of the research team. Now, this makes sense if you acquire diagnostic grade scans. So, for instance, T1, T2 weighted scans, as I have been told. 
uh, but if if you're acquiring only fMRI images, then it doesn't make sense to have a qualified person look at all the scans because uh, they are not of, of diagnostic quality. So it really depends on the research setting or the setting in which the biobank is developed, what the requirements for the pathway for the handling of incidental findings looks like. Now that is not very helpful, uh, but I did want to mention that it is often argued that it is really time consuming and maybe costly to have um, sort of a clinical review of, in this case, scans. But there are also examples, this is one by an article by Shoemaker and colleagues, that says that it is actually financially feasible to look at all scans routinely. This is a paper by Elis and colleagues from over 10 years ago that outlines that there are various types of pathways possible for the handling of incidental findings. And our argument um, in response to this is that some of these pathways are ethically appropriate in some research contexts and others are ethically appropriate in other research contexts. And it really depends on the context, on the setting, which of those um, pathways are the best, are appropriate. So this is what we try to do for, at least initially for imaging. So we wanted to move beyond the current existing guidance that only says that a pathway should be in place and that a pathway should be reviewed by a research ethics review committee, but doesn't explain what needs to be done. We wanted to take that further step and explain what needs to be done um, for various sorts of research settings. This framework uh, was published a couple of years ago and it uh, served also as a foundation for the guidance document that we wrote for BBMRI um, in 2017-18, together with Nikki Arts, who is a pharmacal epidemiologist at the Erasmus Medical Center, and Martin Buchhout, a senior policy advisor at the time for BBMRI NL. And we we use that same seven-step framework that actually uh, to, to inform those involved in, in biobanks on what to do when developing a pathway or policy for the handling of incidental findings. And it actually identifies seven steps more or less chronologically in the pathway of detecting findings, managing findings and communicating findings, seven steps. And we don't, in all these steps, we don't really substantially necessarily say what needs to be done, but we do say these are the moments on which researchers, the research team must make decisions. These are the types of things to think about for each of these seven steps. And we do set out minimum requirements for pathways across different research settings. So at least at minimum, if you have a biobank or you have a research, you should probably look at these things or arrange for these things. And depending on, we also present a lot of best practices and sort of maximum standards for highly demanding pathways. So we, this is the way that we try to translate uh, current ethical guidance and the insights coming from, um, from our interview studies to into a sort of a practical guide. I will not go into details because you can find the guide and it's interactive PDF. You can easily click through it on the internet, but I will just briefly introduce you to some of the topics here, the seven topics. So anticipation of findings is crucial. Um, um, it can be determined beforehand what findings are being expected. And ideally, you can draw up a list of findings that you know based on existing evidence, uh, on clinical benefit, clinical relevance, uh, that you want to report and a list of things that you know that you will find but you are not going to report and you can set up a multidisciplinary team that can discuss whether or not findings should be reported arrangements must be made for confirmation because if you do find a finding before you can feed it back you should ideally uh, have an expert uh, assess it and decide whether or not it should be reported. So these arrangements should be made beforehand 
information and informed consent research participants or biobank donors should know beforehand that incidental findings can be detected if that is the case and how they will be handled and ideally they should be asked for informed consent maybe personalized informed consent some people say and also this report from the presidential commission in, in the us say that you can that it's okay to say to research participants if you don't want findings to be reported you cannot enroll because we don't want our researchers to have that dilemma of wanting to report something and not being able to because you haven't given your permission um on the other hand there are also voices in favor of an opt-out policy of an opt-out opportunity why would sometimes research participants say why couldn't you contribute to a biobank and say but i don't need to find out any individual research results or i don't wish to learn anything about my health shouldn't this be possible in medicine too we have a right not to know why not here in biobank research in terms of data collection we said that it's not necessary to carry out additional tests you just stick to what you need to do for your research purposes um but here too there is this is an area of discussion too so uh in the us uh, it is believed that it sometimes may be a good idea to also look for secondary findings in europe we call this opportunistic screening the basic idea is that while we're at it while we're making a scan or doing a whole genome analysis why are we not also looking at like for instance the american college of medical geneticists says why shouldn't we also look at an additional set of mutations of which we know that they are actionable that it is important for patients for for people to know about these findings in europe um, we are not very much in favor of uh, opportunistic screening mostly um, i think this is a very interesting discussion and i really uh, it is not yet solved uh, there is a big um, sort of contrast between what research participants and biobank donors want namely often they want to find out as much as possible and this idea that we've had in Europe for the last decades that you should always do tests as targeted as possible so as to avoid incidental findings because of the downsides this is I think an interesting discussion to follow the over the next uh, time then in terms of data analysis we said you don't need to make these additional scans but if you do acquire them or analysis if, if you can easily look at your research data and easily sort of scan or screen for abnormalities that may need attention then you probably should do so confirmation of the finding by an expert is something that is really a matter of consensus this is something that is a minimum requirement i would say so this means that even for research groups that do not for instance have a medical doctor within the team should liaise with a medical doctor maybe in a nearby center who can if something comes up and an abnormality is detected who can quickly be asked to uh, review the abnormality communication we said based on our interviews also with research participants that communication of the finding should be done in a careful and prompt manner and we are departing a little bit in this from the code that i showed you that we have in the netherlands that says that it should always be done through a clinician through the, the gp we said that maybe it is more important to have somebody who can interpret the finding and uh, explain the finding uh, and it sometimes may be a researcher from the research team that is better in place to, to do so than the GP um, and there is a moral reason to do this too this is a an, and researcher says that it feels like sharing private information behind someone's back if I contact the, the GP directly because I have a relationship with the research participant and if there is something of relevance, I, we have to talk about this first. And then I ask the research participant, is it okay for me to share this with your doctor? 
and that feels the more like the more appropriate way and i've seen patient representatives voicing this preference as well and then finally follow up i think that there's three issues that are interesting here namely uh, depending on the research setting uh, but for some biobanks it may be good to make arrangements with specialists to ensure that the the clinical follow-up can be as prompt as possible so we have seen best practices um, of research groups who have standing appointments more or less or standing deals with specialists in the hospital so that if they have an abnormality they can place their research participant within a couple of days in the hospital um, of course this is not possible or necessary across all research settings but it is a best practice and then monitoring the effects of the communication of incidental findings the least you can do if you have a repetitive meetings with research participants is ask the next meeting what happened how what happened afterwards how how was the the finding dealt with what is the effect on you and maybe maybe keep track of this uh, also because it helps with the third aspect namely evaluation of the policy what can be improved maybe uh, it's, maybe it's good to do that on a regular basis. Okay, so in the guidance document that you can access on the BBMRI ERIC website, I think, or yes, I've seen it, um, you can find uh, requirements, minimum requirements, of which I would say apply to across all research settings, and maximum standards or best practices on each of these seven sort of stages or points or steps in the, the incidental finding pathway. Um, this is the end of my talk. I wanted to tell you that there is no such thing as an incidental finding and this is of course an exaggeration but I wanted to just motivate and activate uh, you to to think about all the factors that you can control and that help to uh, give rise to incidental findings. They can and should be anticipated. Uh, research participants find that communication aspect very, very important and believe that incidental findings are very personal. So we should maybe look for personalized or individualized approaches and maybe allow for an opt out too. So if somebody wants to contribute to the biobank but doesn't want to hear about individual research results or incidental findings generally or maybe certain types of findings, maybe there should be room for that. And there are minimum requirements for uh, adequate, responsible protocols or pathways uh, for dealing with incidental findings. That was the end of my talk. Thank you for attending. Um, this is my email address, so if you have questions, you can uh, you can you can contact me, you can email me, and we can we can talk, or I can try to respond to them. And with this, can I should I give the role of the presenter back to uh, the organizers? I think. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you very much for this uh, interesting presentation. We have uh, a couple of minutes uh, left for uh, questions. You can use the chat function or uh, the questions uh, window or just raise your hand. I'm Isabel Yesner from the Norwegian Institute of Public Health. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for your presentation, Aline. I think it was really good. I really like what you what you did, and I really like your perspectives. Oh, thank <laughs> um, you. Feedback of incidental findings. I have one question for you, and this is something that has bugged me for some time, <laughs> and um, I, I don't know uh, how to deal with this. Um, and you were saying that uh, feedback depends very much on the context of a research. Um, but you need to take that into consideration that it has some moral implications depending on uh, whether your research is close to the clinic or not. Yes. Um, and I know this argument has been made uh, many times, but it still, it still bugs me. Because if you think of this in 
in a very simple way, I would say that uh, a finding of health relevance is a finding, irrespective of how you found it. Uh, so irrespective of the context, if some information or, or a finding actually has importance for the health of an individual, I don't see that it makes a difference whether the finding has been made on a blood sample that was collected five years ago and we didn't have any contact with that person later on, or whether it was made on a person with whom we have regular contact. So for this individual, the, the value um, of the information would be the same. Yes. So I perfectly I understand that you cannot call someone after five years and say, oh, remember the sample you took five years ago? Well, we found something. Uh, so so there, there must be a way to take into consideration the context, but to me, the value of the finding would still be the same, irrespective of the research context. Yes. And I don't know how to solve that, <laughs> so I wonder whether you have any opinion I think on it's a very good point, and I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think the consensus is all also, if, if you do stumble upon something, and it doesn't matter how or when, uh, but you've think that this is of relevance to the health of the individual, you should act. I think that consensus is there. Um, so I think that we have to differentiate if we look at the, the policies and how they are set up across the different types of research studies. But I think this remains true <laughs> across settings. If you do find something that you think could sort of save, there's this duty of rescue, right? In, mm. in ethics, that uh, applies to all citizens. If we find something that can save the health or the life of another individual, we are expected to act. And this arguably is even more so if, if there is a relationship between two people, such as the one between the researcher and the research participant. Uh, so that remains true. Uh, we talked about how timing is important. But I think also that code that we have in the Netherlands says uh, one of the important criteria is is uh, has what is the likelihood that the that the problem that the finding pertains to has uh, already been detected in the normal course of healthcare. So what is the likelihood that the patient, for instance, would develop symptoms and would accordingly go see a doctor and this would still be on time for adequate treatment? If that is the case, then maybe it's not necessary to co contact somebody five years afterwards because the patient could be treated almost just as well uh, within sort of the regular healthcare system. So these are considerations um is that does that answer the question yes well partly because you still would know for sure uh, that this person actually has been informed about yeah. the finding yeah. so for the um for the researcher uh i don't know whether that would be sufficient but i see i see your point i see that could be um a way to deal with this but um well I'm, I'm just thinking that we need to have procedures that that would apply irrespective of of the context in a way uh, but yeah. emphasizing the, the value of the information in itself yeah um but yes that was not an easy question so <laughs> Uh, thank you. We, we've got another question, which is, uh, is there any experience of returning incidental findings in pediatric research? Oh, yes, there is some. Um, the incidence of incidental findings is, a, is generally a lot lower in, uh, in children, but I think that both in genetics and in imaging, there, there have been some studies detailing the effects of incidental findings in children. Um, most of this work is focused on the clinical follow-up actually, and not necessarily the impact on, on children's lives um, and a wider psychosocial well-being. But there, that there have been some studies. If um, the person who asked the question is interested, I can look up some of those studies that have been done. Um, in children, we have done some 
interviews with parents who had their children involved in uh, a cohort study in Rotterdam. And um, I, what I saw based on those interviews was that uh, in children too, there are these softer impacts too that we talked about uh, before. So for instance, um, a structural abnormality had been found in a child that is probably never going to uh, lead to symptoms. But this parent was telling us, researchers, how um, when that child goes to a, a birthday party in a swimming pool, uh, they will talk to the parents and say, look, our child shouldn't fall on the head and everything. Um, so I, I, I think that you can see these softer impacts if you if you take a qualitative approach and I'm, i haven't seen that um in the literature yet i must say specifically for children okay thank you we've got uh, another question uh it stays by saying wonderful presentation thank you uh, how do we train PhD students so that they enter the world of research with a deeper understanding of the issue in the area? <laughs> that's, a, that's a beautiful question, actually. Um, I think that uh, talking to research participants who have experience with uh, being fed back information about an incidental finding will be helpful both in understanding uh, what was just nicely said the value of incidental findings and in understanding um, some of the impact on uh, on research participants lives and maybe reading about these stories would also be a good idea to uh, to train phd students um, and i think it is important that to help researchers um, uh, understand what is being expected of them when they um, are involved in, in uh, collecting data or analyzing data or reviewing data. Um, they need clear instructions about what to do, how to look at the data. Um, for instance, should they even look for abnormalities? What should they do when they, when they see something? there should be a, a sort of a low threshold, I think, for younger research, researchers to contact their seniors and, and um, discuss what to do, because uh, um, it could very well be that young PhD students uh, who incidentally detect something in a research participant are troubled by this and, and, and really need some help in, in uh, deciding what to do. Uh, thank you. We are unfortunately running out of time, so I will just briefly take a last question. <laughs> I don't know if there is a, a brief answer. It says, in a research context where the data comes from an openly available repository, what is the procedure of returning incidental findings? Um, so an openly available repository uh, could allow anyone uh, to detect an incidental finding without there being a relationship between a researcher and a research participant? That's an interesting question. Um, I think that uh, th this, is just, <laughs> this is just my, thir my first thought, but I think that we would expect um, the same from researchers. I mean, if the finding pertains to something that is serious indicative of a serious disease for which there are options so as to avoid harm to an individual i think that we would expect that person to ask and to maybe contact um, the team who was responsible for obtaining the data and will probably know how to re-identify and contact uh, the research participant i think uh, but these are exceptions. These are probably <laughs> exceptions, I'm thinking, instead of things that could actually save lives or save health. Most might pertain to things less serious and less requiring 
uh, immediate attention. All right, I'm sorry we are out of time. Uh, maybe we can uh, follow up with uh, the remaining questions on individually or if uh, the uh, persons are getting in touch with you. Uh, Eileen, uh, many thanks for the very interesting presentation and for your time. That was uh, very interesting. And um, yeah, the guide you mentioned, which is available on the website, I uh, really highly recommend it. It's a really interesting and useful document. So um, thank you very much. And uh, yeah, yeah uh, we can follow up on this important topic in the future. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay, goodbye.